Hoo-hoo-hoo. Scary sounding dude. Hey everybody, this is AJ for the Mighty Clue Stick channel. Back with another Lord of Ruin. Demon Kind first appeared in 1976 as seven demon types, as well as the succubus, which were first described in the Eldritch Wizardry supplement for the original D&D box set. In that box, we also saw the first two demon lords. Demogorgon and his eternal foe, Orcus. Orcus is first described in Algid Wizardry as a grossly fat demon lord, covered in goat-like hair, 15 feet tall with a goat-like head and legs, and the horns of a ram rather than those of a goat. His arms are human, he has vast bat-like wings that sprout from his back, and has long sneaky tail that's tipped with a poisonous head. The book also notes that he is extremely intelligent, and mentions a number of magical abilities that he can use, such as being able to summon whites, wraiths, spectres, and vampires, as he is the Prince of the Undead. Orcus, like other types of demons introduced in Eldritch Wizardry, had the ability to use psychic abilities. He had an alternate form at one point called Tenebrius, more on how that came to be later on, and Tenebrius is described nicely in the adventure called Dead Gods. It says it was as if someone had taken a large man and squeezed him until all the light was wrung out like water, leaving only the purest of darkness. He was gaunt as those from a long illness, like someone who had never experienced illumination, or perhaps it had driven itself from him completely. He carried no weapon and made no move to strike, yet there was something inherently threatening about him. He was angular, almost shadowy and ethereal, eyes dark and piercing, staring out, but saying nothing. The Book of Vile Darkness describes Orcus as a massive, bloated demon prince, bloated on spite, bile and contempt. Orcus grew fat, consuming the demonic larvae in his realm. Now he focuses his anger and hate on the absolute destruction of his enemies and the spread of woe and havoc among mortals. The book refers to him as appearing as an archetypical demon, noting that when commoners think demons, they most likely think of some terrible picture of Orcus that they once saw somewhere. His black skull-tipped rod serves as his symbol. The fourth edition Monster Mantle describes Orcus as one of the most powerful demons in the Abyss, powerful enough to threaten gods. It describes him as a foul and corpulent humanoid creature who has powerful goat legs and a desiccated head similar to that of a ram. His great wings stir up a reeking cloud of diseased air. He seems somewhere between life and death. His sore-ridden body suggests diseased life, but his head and glowing red eyes suggest undeath. His thick, spiny tail is in constant motion. Although he is the demon prince of undeath, Orcus actually despises the undead, using them without thought or consideration. He despises the living as well. He really hates everything except for achieving personal power and spreading misery and destruction. You could say that Orcus loathes and despises the entire universe. He wants it to suffer before it is destroyed. He wants to be the one who directs and controls every bit of that horror. One can never really curry favour with Orcus, since he legitimately hates everything. It's not that he wants to rule everything, he just wants to be the last thing left in existence. To know that he destroyed it all. He is born of the contempt, loathing and hatred of all living things, manifested when the Queen of Chaos birthed him from the seething pus sacks of one of the Sibriac's flesh shapers. And yep, he hates them too. The history of Orcus in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons is rich and complex. He appeared as a central theme in the Bloodstone Pass Saga, a series of four adventures released from 1985 until 1988. Orcus doesn't appear in the first three adventures, but his presence is foreshadowed in them. In the last adventure, The Throne of Bloodstone, the player characters battle through many layers to arrive in the realm of the dead, a layer of the abyss and home to Orcus. There, the challenge is to destroy Orcus's wand and have the details. Um, I've got the details of how it can be achieved later in this video, thanks to a somewhat biased advice from Bahamut. 
Second edition Dungeons and Dragons, published during the middle of the moral panic of the 1990s, saw orcas thrown into obscurity. The demons were renamed Tanari, their demon lords were unmentioned. In the release of Planescape in 1994, although still ignoring orcas, they did at least detail his home, the 113th layer of the abyss, Thanatos, the belly of death. Here we learn that at some point Orcus had been slain, or at least disposed, by the goddess Kieransli, and that his name was no longer spoken. In 1996, Hellbound, the Blood War, was published, and we learned that Orcus's supposed death was part of a meta plot for Planescape, and that he would secretly return for the Great Modron March in 1997, that same year. The full story of what happened was revealed in Dead Gods. Orcus was indeed slain by Kiransli, and we learned that about this, and I'll try to keep this brief. So, I mentioned that Orcus was birthed in the Abyss at the time the Queen of Chaos was creating her slave race of warriors, the demons. Now, that may be misleading. He was not born as Orcus. He was born a mortal, a powerful spellcaster who lived and died on some primaterial realm long ago. His soul released in death but then caught up in the foul act of creation the Queen of Chaos had begun, some time after she had created Demogorgon, first of demonkind. She had perfected the art and instead spawned lesser forms, so like the majority of demons, Orcus began his afterlife as a lowly larvae. Orcus proceeded to climb through the demonic ranks over the next several thousand years, going from Larvae to Main, from Main to Dretch, from Dretch to Rutican, from Rutican to Vrock, from Vrock to Glabrizu, from Glabrizu to Nalfeshni, and eventually a Balor. From there, he ascended to the rank of Demon Lord, becoming the Prince of the Undead and ruling the layer of Thanatos, the Belly of Death. Even though there are other demon lords aspiring to the title of Prince of the Undead. Orcus's claim to the title went unchallenged, for the most part. Ever hungry for more power, Orcus wanted to be recognised as Prince of Demons, a title held by Demogorgon and coveted also by Garazd. As a result, he became the arch enemy of both demon lords. In time, Orcus also achieved true godhood. The story of how he achieved this is convoluted and spans thousands of years. In minus 1025 DR, a human worshipper of Orcus called Thargorn became the first king of Tharos, which would later become known as Narfel. His dynasty would rule until minus 633 DR when the Lich King Balavan was slain by the twin sons of Grast. The feud between demon lords can steer the course of an entire nation in the mortal world. In minus 431 DR, Jethrin, Darach, a half fiendish son of Orcus, was born, and in minus 399 DR, Jethrin slew King Orlathon, a human descendant of Grast, and ascended to the throne of Narfel, holding it until his death 77 years later. In minus 367 DR, Orcus fathered another son, Heldakar Darak, another woman of the Darak line, was his mother. This woman was sacrificed to Orcus immediately following Heldakar's birth. This would become a tradition in the Darak dynasty, and Heldakar ascended to the throne of Narfel in minus 322 DR, following the death of his half-brother, Jesthrin and held the title for the next 100 years. And so it continued. Following her held the car's rule of 100 years, he was replaced by another half-son of Orcus, Janos the Slayer. He only held the throne for 29 years and was succeeded by his half-brother, Gartholon, the Gore Claw, who held the throne for 35 years, and then his half-brother, Ilithar, ascended the throne in minus 235 DR. However, in minus 181 DR, Ilithkar was overthrown by his cousin, Relagorn, the Horned, a half-fiendish son of Fras Urblu, a rival of Orcus, 
thus breaking a dynasty entirely of Orcus's own making that had lasted for hundreds of years. Sometime in the 900s DR, Orcus became the patron of the red wizard Zengi, aiding him in his quest to become a lich. Orcus, a priest of Orcus, supported Zengi in 1347 DR when Zengi created the Castle Perilous, giving the lich control over many undead creatures. This led to the nine year assault on Damara, which ended when the lich finally caught brought it under his control in 1357 DR. Zengi lost his power when Gareth Dragonsbane and his company banished Orcus's power from the realm by stealing Orcus's wand, causing Zengi's undead army to disintegrate, and thus Castle Perilous and Zengi the Witch King were defeated. Simultaneously, Orcus was slain by the drow demigoddess Kierancelli who took over rulership of Orcus's layer of the abyss and locked his, apparently restored, wand away in the last layer of pandemonium. Kieranzali decreed that Orcus's name be erased from all existence. Okay, so up to speed? Great. Now it gets really interesting. Despite the drow demigoddess's efforts, Orcus was restored as an undead demon lord, renaming himself Tenebrius. As Tenebrius, Orcus discovered the last word, an utterance so powerful it could destroy deities. The last word would eventually kill those who knew it, unless that being was a true deity. And to restore himself to his former power, Orcus went in search of his wand. During his search, Orcus killed several gods, including Primus, god of the Modrons, and Manzekorin, the illithid god of secrets. Yeah, mind flayers have gods as well, fun fact. Orcus's efforts were tanked by a group of adventurers and the power of the last word, which destroyed Orcus before he could achieve his ascendance. Thanks to Timnebrius, aka Orcus's dangerously close attempt at godhood, an alliance of greater deities then nullified the last word. That didn't keep Orcus down for long, though, as he was resurrected by Kwa Namog, one of his foremost high priests and thralls, in a blasphemous ritual he enacted in the astral plane. Orcus was extracted from Tenebrius and then returned to Thanatos, laid the smack down on Creancele, reclaimed his kingdom and his original name, reproclaiming himself the Prince of the Undead. However, as a result of his second death and resurrection, Orcus has lost his chance at true divinity and returned to his status as a, just a very, very powerful demon lord. Orcus's divine alter ego thereafter existed as a vestige. The husk of Tenebrius still drifts in the astral plane and can, in theory, be called upon by seekers of dead gods. Mortals, even though um, even thoroughly evil demon cultists, have a difficult time comprehending that Orcus doesn't care about them at all. He doesn't hate them less for the fact they are cruelly sacrificing innocence in his name. Unlike Demogorgon, he has no special desire to see clerics of the powers of good put to a gruesome death on altars dedicated to his name. That would only imply that he hates some less than others. Perhaps it was, if it was a thousand of them, that would be better. 10,000, 100,000, an entire species, all life on a planet, perhaps that would bring pleasure to Orcus. No, he would merely hate that such achievements are such a rare occurrence, and despise his would-be servants for their failure to be more effective. Orcus was actually fathered, uh, featured a lot in 4th edition. His rival with the Raven Queen was a central plot to major adventure paths. Uh, now we can see Orcus step into the spotlight again in 5th edition in the Rage of Demons storyline. His battle against his ancient enemy Demogorgon is, uh, is on thrust into the material plane once again, and it's a very fitting return for these two original superpowers of evil. I'll be uh, going over Orcus's listing in that book at the end of this video. The Wand of Orcus is of quite, quite interest. The adventure Dead God reveals how Orcus created the wand. 
Long ago, he trapped the spirit of a mighty hero named Anarchocles within a circlet of control for a skeleton warrior and safeguarded the item to keep it from being used against him. When Anarchocles died, Orcus removed the skull from his destroyed corpse and placed it on the end of a long iron scepter, infusing it with some of his own essence, thus creating the wand of Orcus. A character wearing the circlet can even see through the eyes of the skull of the scepter when within a few hundred feet. If the circlet is touched to the skull, both the circlet and the wand turn to dust, and the character will die instantly, unless the character is actively trying to control the wand at that moment. Uh, and Anarchocles feels an insane sense of revenge for his imprisonment, and wants to kill anyone he can, especially anyone in possession of the circlet. Anarchocles is aware of what happens outside the circlet, and if he senses that the wand is near, he will force the characters to touch the circlet to the skull, thus destroying both items and granting Anacocles eternal rest. If the characters decide to keep the wand of Orcus instead, the party members will begin to fall under its evil influence and stop at nothing to possess it. Any character who travels to an empty plane of the abyss with the wand can set up a lair under their own rule, and after 30 days, they will irrevo irrevocably become a demon lord. Even in the times when Orcus is dead and the wand um, is lesser in power, it's still intelligent and extraordinarily powerful, despite its weakened state. Those who find the wand and do not have the circlet can still remove it from that plane of existence by great magic, or by sacrificing their own life by picking it up and commanding it to plane shift away an act which is invariably fatal to a mortal. The wand is actually a black obsidian and iron rod which is topped with the skull of a human slain by Orcus, though the skull is magically enlarged and greatly enhanced. The wand causes death or annihilation to any creature by touching it to their flesh, except for creatures of a like or similar status to Orcus himself, or higher status of course. The wielder can move at double speed, cure light wounds once per day, can speak with animals, or cause a serious wound. Orcus relies heavily on his wand in combat and prefers to kill foes in melee combat with it. In addition, the wand communicates silently with its wielder, an abyssal, using brutal and gory imagery to highlight its blood-soaked ends. The Plain of Thanatos is a lair which is a land of ruin and death, with sterile heaths, black forests, and desolate mountains filled with ruins and scattered tombs, inhabited by a great variety of undead. <clears throat> the demon lord Orcus, the prince of undeath, ruler of Thanatos, sits in his uh, bone seat in the everlasting Everfrost Palace, a palace made of obsidian and bone, located in a vast wasteland called Oblivion's End. Orcus has been temporarily disposed uh, by Karansley, and he's now returned stronger than ever. He maintains a second lair in the fortress city of Naratir, the city of the dead. It is a quiet, cold, and mostly empty city, except for the occasional wandering undead, who are constantly at war with each other, surrounded by an icy moat fed by the river Styx. The city used to be Karansley's winter capital and was left deserted following the return of the layer's original master, so it still has some drow elven trappings to its decorations. The inner walls of the central castle are bone and covered in flesh and decorated with carpets of human hair. Some sources counted this layer as 333. Uh, it's actually 113 now, just a reminder that the numbers of the layers are largely arbitrary and bear little relation to the plane's actual locations or proximity to each other. And it's just a method of keeping track of them, so that the numbers may change if more dominant portals are established from one layer to another. The worshippers of Orcus, the cult of Orcus, is mainly composed of twisted creatures with a morbid fascination with the undead, such as necromancers, as well as creatures deliberately seeking the path to unlife, such as would-be liches and vampires. All intelligent undead are aware of Orcus, particularly the most powerful of the intelligent und undead, as the route of negative energy which empowers them is so dominated by Orcus that a sliver of his essence exists inside all undead, and thus... 
Those who are conscious are a little bit aware of Orcus' consciousness at all times. Yet Orcus is not yet an elevated god. He has no portfolios granted him by the overgod Ao. He does not have dominion over all dead and departed souls. Uh, other gods hold those roles, those portfolios. The cult called the Ashen Covenant was founded some time ago by Elder Aranthum, a former priest of Bahamut who had a crisis of faith and sought immortality by turning wholly to the worship of Orcus. You can imagine this crisis of faith was something pretty heinous. Subjecting himself to a foul ritual which transformed him and into a cursed creature called a Hecubus, cursed by the gods and as an unholy apostate into a vile creature of undeath. Word of this legendary de deed spread through many sects of the cult of Orcus, and new members swelled the ranks of the covenant. Preaching the blood lord's praises, Elder Aranthum returned to the church of Bamahut, where he once served, slaughtered everyone there, raised them as zombies, and set them loose on the city in an insane bloodbath. Again, word spread of this cult's membership tripled in number, and despite the alliance of three holy orders seeking to uh, destroy the cult, none could locate Elder Aranthum and the cult's hidden shrine. Now powerful enough to draw the attention of an exarch of Orcus, an undead Glabrizu named Holtwear appeared before the congregation in a burst of flame and immediately started to berate old Elder Aranthum for his rash and overt actions, which drew too much attention to what was supposed to be a hidden cult. Aranthum invited the ex exarch into a private sanctum to discuss the matter and later appeared before his cultists covered in the undead demon's blood, proclaimed himself a new exarch of Orcus, and when he was not struck down by the demon prince immediately, his followers once more spread word of his awesome deed, and again, the ranks of his cult swelled. The aim of the cult is pretty simple. They seek to elevate Orcus to the status of a god of death and undeath. They also engage in sick, horrific acts of worship and sacrifice to their blood lord and make a habit of creating and releasing undead to sow misery and chaos into the world. A number of powerful undead are members of the covenant, including vampires, death knights, and some very influential necromancers. Much more overt worship of Orcus is carried out by some orc and goblinoid tribes, but you can find cults, sects, and tribal shamans in all sorts of savage cultures, particularly among cannibals. <clears throat> in civilized society, many wizards fail to heed the warning signs when delving into lore of necromancy. Through its secrets, they learn how to greatly extend their lifespan, but at the same time, they are learning forbidden and subversive truths that subtly turn them further from the influence of divine beings. The normalization of rituals which manipulate life and death leads to the wizard's casual contemplation of transformation into a lich. It's in all a gentle but slippery slope that tumbles the spellcaster's fate into the waiting grasp of Orcus. Orcus will stop at nothing to destroy all life and replace it all with his own twisted mockery of it. He is less satisfied with living servants, preferring to instead raise up capable undead thralls. Life itself disgusts him. He hates it, and is very motivated to snuff it all out, but is intelligent enough to ensure this is achieved by as many means as possible. At any one moment, he is aware of and directing thousands of plots, hundreds of cults, many exarches and avatars, granting power to a small army of warlocks, channeling spells and powers for his clergy, and influencing the action of all manner of undead everywhere. He never rests. Even while appearing to rest atop a blackened throne, his mind is furiously active, his power radiating into the cosmos, spreading evil everywhere. Warlocks who take the Fiend Pact with Orcus can use a unique template for level advancements powers and expanded spell list options. An excellent option is Michael's specific warlock patron number 11, Orcus, Demon Lord of Thanatos. I'll leave a link in the doobly-doo down below to that great resource. Except I would allow the player to swap any of the pact features for level equivalent ones from either the Fiend Pact or the Great Old One Pact, since Orcus is such a potent force of ancient evil. Also, having an undead familiar is just really cool. 
Orcus has a habit of littering artifacts, profane sites, ancient tomes, lingering spirits, subversive agents, and secretive texts carved into the walls of ancient ruins all over the place. He is known to leave his wand of death on the prime material plane now and then, just so that various factions will go to war with each other in order to possess it, before stepping in to wipe the floor with whoever thought they had come out on top. And as you can see from his shifting state of either living or dead, reborn or split into different states of power, located here and then there on various planes, Orcus is very much on the cusp of true divine status. He operates across the planes of existence in many of the same ways a god does, but without the elevation of Ao, true transdimensional cohesion will forever be out of his grasp. But it appears he is one entity who has achieved a form of true immortality. Death itself can never fully destroy him, and he will eventually resurface fully and just as powerful as he was before. From his original genesis by the Queen of Chaos and his rise to power as a first a bow, Balor General of Oberynth armies under Miska the Wolf Spider, then as a demon warlord of the Abyssal Revolution and the Eons Long Blood War, and now a principal power of demon kind, Orcus is one of the greatest foes and most potent beings of evil in the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. I imagine that standing in the presence of such a being as a mere mortal would be like an ocean of evil and torment was crushing the very life and hope out of you by the second, a choking torrent of psychic wailing threatening to shatter your mind, your skin peeling and blistering with foul wafts of corruption, and with a word, Orcus can drop you to the ground, sniveling for your tiny fleeting life as you scream, vomit, and swell yourself before dying. To actually meet the gaze of hatred is to invite insanity right into your skull. The listing for Orcus in the latest uh, supplement, the Out of the Abyss Adventure, is pretty good. Orcus is armor class 17, um, as I say he's 15 feet tall, 20 with the Wand of Orcus. He's got 405 hit points, uh, speed is 40 feet and he can fly at 40 feet. His stats are all basically godlike, apart from a reasonably low dexterity of 14. Uh, he has damage resistance to cold, fire, and lightning, immunity to necrotic, poison, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from anything that is non-magical. He's immune for being charmed, exhausted, frightened, or poisoned. He's got true sight out to 120 feet. Passive perception is 22. He's got telepathy out to 120 feet, but he can speak every single language. He's listed as a challenge rating 26. The Wand of Orcus has seven charges, and any of its properties that require a saving throw have a DC of 18. While holding it, Orcus can use an action to cast Animate Dead, Blight, or Speak with Dead. Alternatively, he can expend one or more of the Wand's charges to cast one of his favorite spells, Circle of Death, Finger of Death, or Power Word Kill for two charges. The Wand regains 1d4 plus 3 charges daily at dawn. When holding the Wand, he can use an action to conjure undead creatures that uh, combine a total average hit points that don't exceed 500. These undead magically rise up from the ground or otherwise form in unoccupied spaces within 300 feet of Orcus and obey his every command. Once the uh, this property of the wand is used, it can be used again until the next dawn. Innate spell casting, of course, is pretty potent. He's DC 23, plus 15 to hit with all of his spell attacks. He can innately cast many spells, such as Chill Touch, Detect Magic, uh, Create Undead to Spell Magic, Time Stop once a day. He's got Legendary Resistance three times a day. Magical Resistance, um, anything that requires the save against magic, he's got advantage on that. His, all of his weapon attacks and his physical attacks are counted as magical. And he's a master of undeath. He casts animated dead or create undead. He chooses the level at which the spell is cast and the creatures created by the spells remain under his control forever. Additionally, he can cast create undead even when he isn't in sight. Um, or it isn't night, I should say. He uh, attacks mainly with the wand, uh, attacking twice per round. And uh, he's plus 19 to hit got a reach of 10 feet and does 21 bludgeoning damage plus 13 necrotic damage on a touch. His tail attack is plus 17 to hit, does a 10 foot reach. One target takes 21 piercing damage and 18 poison damage. I would say that's necrotic flesh rotting poison. 
And of course he's got legendary actions, lair actions, and regional effects from his mere presence. Including my favourite, which is the ability to boom out his voice and basically use power word kill DC 23. He doesn't even have to be in sight of someone, he just has to know they're somewhere in his lair and within earshot. Pretty good. And of course he raises up demons all over, uh, skeletons and undead creatures all over the place. The place is just swarming with them. Well... I hope you enjoyed this video on another of the principal Lords of Ruin. Obviously next on the list would have to be none other than that smooth operator, the Ebon Lord of the Abbot, Dulor, Grasts, the Dark Prince. I'll catch you later everybody. Thanks for listening.